My name is Ashlyn Rose, and I am the General and Artistic Director at the Theatre Centre in Toronto. Thank you so much for joining us for Field Notes from the Future. You can join our conversation on Twitter via the hashtag FieldNotesTC. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the future of our global carbon crisis and climate justice. But before we begin, I'd like to introduce two beloved Theatre Centre co-conspirators. Why Not Theatre's Artistic Director, Ravi Jain, and award-winning science journalist, Elena Mitchell. Hi, Ravi. Hey, Ashlyn, how's it going? Elena. Good. Welcome, Elena. Hi. So um, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the Theater Center, our gatherings, our offices where we work, are situated on the traditional territories of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Anishinaabe and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. And this is now the home of many nations, many First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. As a settler with Irish roots, I am grateful for the welcome that was offered to my parents when they arrived in what we now call Canada. And I hope to reciprocate the generosity that was offered to them. I'm also grateful that I am able to make my home here in the Dish With One Spoon territory. I was reminded at an event earlier this year that we as settlers have all been added to this covenant and that it predates any other agreement in which we've since engaged. And in the spirit of this, the conversation we're about to have, I wanted to share with you some of the language of that covenant. The dish, or sometimes it is called the bowl, represents what is now Southern Ontario. We all eat out of the dish all of us that share this territory with only one spoon. That means we have to share the responsibility of ensuring the dish is never empty, which includes taking care of the land and the creatures we share it with. I work with an incredible team of humans who all strive to ensure that the Theatre Centre continues to honour, through our actions and our attitudes, the past, present and future stewards of these lands and waterways. And of course, there is always more work to be done as we steward the resources of our organization and prepare them for those who will come after us. Hi, thank you so much for being here tonight. Six years ago, Franco Bonnie, who's at Push Festival in Vancouver and Ravi and I worked together on a play called Seasick, which was based on a book that I wrote about how the carbon load in the atmosphere is harming the ocean and setting the stage for another mass extinction. At the end of the play, we ask, how does the story end? Today, the answers to that question are different than they were even just 13 weeks ago. Our world has fractured in ways we couldn't have imagined. COVID has killed people. It's locked us at home, afraid of getting sick or getting dying or infecting others. The economy has tanked and people are having a hard time feeding their families. White supremacy has reared its horrific head and people are taking to the streets in righteous anger against the systems that have let it live. Scientists, doctors, theater makers, artists, journalists, everybody is in revolt against this old system that makes us unsafe. And that tells me that the story or the mythology that our society tells itself about what matters is fraying. That fraying carries great opportunity and great danger. It means that we are able to see how all these stories connect to each other and imagine a new future. What if things could be different? What is possible today that wasn't possible before? This is a time begging for a new mythology to be born. And part of building a new mythology means we need to face an old and, insidu and an insidious reality, racism, and the dehumanization of Black, Indigenous, and racialized peoples for centuries and its impact on people today. The senseless deaths of Black and Indigenous men and women continue in broad daylight at the hands of police in Canada and the United States. And in this moment, we are being asked to think about our fear, our silence, and our complicity in white supremacist systems. White people are awakening to the new reality that many experience of us experience every day. Racism seethes throughout society 
and has been upheld and supported in institutions like the arts and culture in Canada. But you know, we've been here before. We've seen all of this before. You have been awoken before. And in the past, white people, when they make their calls of, sol they make call of solidarity, but then the moment moves on. Social media moves on. And then we all have to move on. But it comes at a great cost. So what will be different this time? What will cause lasting change? What will it take for us all to say that black lives matter and mean it? If you can understand racism, you will understand that every day black indigenous and racialized people are told that they don't belong, that they're not equal. And to all the white people calling for solidarity today, I'm reminding you that we are not equal in this moment. We are not in solidarity unless you are willing to do the work because it will take work to dismantle white supremacy and anti-blackness in ourselves, in our communities, in all the systems that govern us. Yes, in the arts too. And in order for this moment to be meaningful, white people need to see what we see. They need to see themselves as the upholder of the system. See yourself in the police officer you wanna protest against. Scream at your racist self, change your racist self. Looking at yourself will hurt and it has to because only then will we truly be in solidarity. The police officer had his knee on the neck of George Floyd for almost nine minutes. The whole time people were asking him to remove it. They told that police officer that if he didn't remove his knee, he would die. And that police officer, he didn't have to listen. His hands were in his pockets. No fear of consequences, supremacy. And you too, you've heard these cries before. And you too have had your hands in your pockets. The question now is, are you really listening? Will you do the work to remove your knee? Speaking to Alana in the last couple of days has given me a glimmer of hope in what has felt like a very hopeless time, seeing a hopeless future because I've been let down before and it comes at a great cost. So Alana says that it's di more difficult to choose to have courage and to choose hope in this moment. And I believe her and I will, but I'm counting on all of us to face ourselves, fight ourselves, scream at our racist selves. And then maybe you will listen the next time that a black person or an indigenous person or a person of color tells you that you and your system are racist, that you and your theater is ra are racist. Will you give up your power and finally let someone else lead this conversation? If you do nothing, the results will be devastating. They would be unforgivable. So what will it take to create lasting change? How will we write a new story, build a new mythology, acknowledge that we can't have climate justice without first addressing the interconnected systems of white supremacy, colonialism, patriarchy, and capitalism. We've got to find a way to heal this world of ours to make it safe for all of us. The stakes are high. We've seen a lot of things during this pandemic that many of us didn't think were possible even a few months ago. Some of the most low paying and precarious jobs being named the most essential, a serious national conversation about universal basic income, mainstream conversations about defunding the police, governments changing policies on a dime, telling businesses what they can and can't do, pledging to make the post pandemic recovery green and people not hesitating to stand up for what they believe in. This evening we're talking about a future that's been blown open and there will be work, and there will be a cost, and there will be a future to build, and it's going to take all of us.
these times of chaos have given us permission to think in new ways, to ask different questions, to mourn resolutely, but also to feel the joy that comes with creating something new, with healing the world that we live in. So here tonight with you, we're exploring the new edges of the possible. And Kai Chan and Alianor Rougeau are going to help. Kai is an ecologist and sustainability scientist at UBC in Vancouver, who specializes in thinking outside the box and across disciplines. He was the lead author on the very first international study to map out exactly what it will take to keep the world safe from too much carbon. It came out last year. And Ali is the coordinator of the Climate Strike Group, Fridays for Future in Toronto. She's going into her fourth year in economics and public policy at the University of Toronto. She's been a human rights and environmental activist since she was 10 years old. So here are the questions that are obsessing me. And maybe we could start with you, Ali. It's just, what do you think is possible in this moment that wasn't possible before? Well, first of all, good evening, Alana. Hi, Kai. Um, it's great to Ali. be here. Hi, Alana. Um, I mean, I, and I guess in a way you're asking, you know, what has changed, what's possible now. Um, I'll yeah. be honest, at the very beginning of the pandemic, when it started, I felt the opposite. It fell down. It felt like the momentum that had come from the year of climate strikes was mm -hmm. shut down. And it honestly felt pretty violent because all of a sudden, you know, we got our energies from strike. I got my energies for being in class and like talking to my peers. Oh, there's a strike next week. Like, come. And all of a sudden that got shut down. And so at first it felt like it was blocking. But then the few first things that made me think, actually, this might be the window of opportunity that my public policy professors talk about all the time. And that was the moment where governments on screen and even governments like Doug Ford's government said, this is a historic moment and how we react will define how we will be seen in history. And I thought we could have heard that for another crisis than the COVID <laughs> crisis. And same when government said acting now saves lives. And I thought that that's something I could reuse later. And so I started seeing how we could actually draw parallels. And all of a sudden it felt like I think what can change is the public opinion. All of a sudden I think public awareness can be um, kind of change and, and brought back to climate where it was it was harder before because we were in our everyday lives that hadn't been stopped for a while. Okay and, and what about you Kai? What do you think? Yeah. Is oh I totally agree. I mean I think that we're at this moment of opportunity where we have collectively grappled with this problem of uh, COVID-19 in a way that so many of us as individuals and as communities have given up things that we are used to and doing it not only for ourselves, but also very much for others, right? Looking out for those who are most vulnerable. And the hope is that rather than being a distraction from the climate crisis, maybe this moment of opportunity and this kind of solidarity with everyone around this world, where we all clearly recognize that this phenomenon of COVID-19 is affecting us all, that hopefully we can see the parallels of that to climate change and recognize that it's going to take the same kind of sacrifice and more, maybe. It's at least longer lasting. It's going to take the same kind of working together, the same kind of selflessness. Um, and I'm just hoping that we're ready to do that in a way that rethinks the systems that brought us to this place, that brought us the climate crisis, the ecological crisis, and this crisis of oppression of uh, marginalized and minority communities. You know, the thing that amazes me is just what the governments have been able to do. And, you know, I'm seeing them, uh, you know, pass policies that that would have been unthinkable just a few weeks ago and, and do it, re you know, with with all this determination. And I'm just I'm thinking to myself, what held them back before? <laughs> do you know? I mean, I, it's amazing. I mean, the amount of money that has been spent on this crisis that is really in the grand scheme of things smaller than the climate crisis by far. And yet the amount of money that's been spent in this one budget year and yeah. the amount and the impact on our economies is going to be so much larger than what climate scientists have been asking for decades to yeah. avert this massive global catastrophe. Right. So it's quite amazing the, the kind of turnaround. And, and it's obviously it's because it's an acute problem. We can clearly see it. We can trace that people are actually dying of this disease, whereas climate change has this diffuse diffuseness problem where it's so much easier for people to explain away, to make excuses. And so hopefully, though, we'll be able to bring that kind of a recognition of the interconnectedness and, and, and recognize that climate is just as big a problem, if not bigger. 
Right. What about you, Ali? What do you, you, you've been lobbying governments for, you know, more than a year saying, you know, and you've been asking for much less than they've given in a sense in the last 13 weeks. What do you think was holding them back? Yeah, seriously. I mean, you know, I it think frustrating, right? <laughs> it, was, it was kind of frustrated. You know, I thought, wait, now industries are being asked to like produce what we need. Essentially, we've been asking that for years, but in a way, what it, what, seemed to have triggered it is maybe well you know this is maybe like the youth voice thinking but the people most affected were a lot of the people that are often in power or close to power um so older folks in some cases um it was also a crisis that was so simple you know kai said it, it was it was a easy external threat it didn't come from our internal politics we weren't questioning capitalism at first at least or we weren't you know it wasn't COVID didn't emerge from uh, our banking system or anything. It emerged from somewhere else. And it's like in a war, it's easy to have your external enemy and have the whole nation come behind. But then when you have to look at yourself, like Ravi so eloquently said, you have to scream at yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. I feel like that's where governments, they just, they just can't get around it because, I mean, it would be admitting their own failures for years. And I think they're like, they're, they're, they feel like they're too deep, not knowing they're digging themselves deeper every day, but... Mm -hmm. It's just at the, same, at the same time, there's, there's been this amazing response. I think we also need to keep checking and keep, keep questioning that response. You know, I mean, there's a real danger that in this moment of opportunity, that the spending that we do, that governments do to prop up industries, that, that some of that will actually hold us back from tackling the climate change, climate crisis, and other linked crises. Right. So, take for example, travel. We, I, I used to be flying around. Canada, US, the, around internationally across oceans once a month, if not more often, half those trips seemed kind of unnecessary if I thought about it from the collective sense. Now that we're in these times of COVID, we have shut those many of those trips down. I haven't traveled and I've been able to keep up so many of those work obligations through just virtual connections. That's amazing. But people are rushing to get back to that. The airline industries are clamoring for bailouts that will enable them to grow that demand back for that travel that we arguably don't even need, right? And it's we've got this moment of, to transform our systems. And the real worry is that instead of transforming that system, we're going to bail out these companies in industries that really ought to be scaling back and thinking about how to do things differently to supply what people really need rather than what they think they need and what they want on a, in a kind of superficial level. But frankly, many of my colleagues didn't even want to travel like that. You know, we just wanted an excuse to be able to do it in a, in a virtual way. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, the, the thing that strikes me so much is that is that we have um, we have pulled together, and that that is the thing that I find so fascinating because it's a cultural shift. It's not we're all uh, you know doing what climate activists have asked you know for uh, decades. Really, they've been saying, look, let's pull together and look at the future and make our planet healthy for future generations, for ourselves today. And and that it, that seems to be one of the one of the things that has just taken hold without without too much trouble. We all knew we had to do something and we did it. And, uh, you know, what, we're, what, what climate activists have been asking for is actually a lot less in a lot of ways in terms of, you know, one's own personal habits in terms of what you, what you want to do. So it's that, it's that shift in what we think we're for that I find so interesting. Do you, do you see that? Or, yeah? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's quite amazing. It, <laughs> There is a difference, right? And there's an, an important element to that where the thing that we were asked to do was to, to shelter others from, from our disease risk, right? right? But that exact same action paid serious dividends for all of us in terms of avoiding our own risk of getting sick. Right. And, and the benefits to individuals from avoiding the risk of them getting sick is actually greater than the benefit to others in, in many cases. Whereas with climate, it's the opposite way around, right? We, yes, absolutely, by reducing our admission, emissions, we all enjoy a benefit, but most people benefit more than I benefit as an individual, right? Most of that benefit is externalized. Right. So we, you know, we've, we've really got to kind of wear that mantle of selflessness even stronger for the climate crisis. Um, yeah. Hopefully we can do that. Ali, do you think we can? Yeah, I mean, that's the that's a really good way to put it. It's uh, what the youth, I think, doesn't have as much is this thing that we're not going to get 
the benefits of solving the climate crisis because we know we're gonna, you know, we're internalizing much more the cost because we see it over our lifetime. Um, but I agree, it's always how do we have, and I think the arts and and all all the arts really have a huge role to play in this is making us feel as if the benefits were more tangible than they might actually be right now. Um, but I think going back a tiny bit to what Kai and you as well, Alana, were saying before about kind of like what could happen <laughs> after this COVID if we do go back to normal or if we go back to worse than normal, what scares me a lot is more concentration of power, more big tech now having all our, all our you know, data and having all of us hooked on this and not paying attention more of the small companies being bought back by the big ones. And so um, I think when we're having this conversation, it's like, are we going to fight for a new normal or are we fighting against a worse normal as well at the same time? It's, I think that fuels me twice as much as we also have to avoid a rollback on some progress we had made in the past decades. Definitely. While we're listing fears, I'll, I'll name some more of mine. I, I'm afraid that people are going to be afraid to take public transit and that they're going to be in their cars a lot more. I'm afraid that people with this, this experience of the lockdown, who are those who are stuck in cities, that dense living that we you know, are told is more sustainable, and I believe that entirely, that those people are going to feel like it's, it's a better existence out in the countryside where when a pandemic happens, you can still get out and go for a walk. You still have your backyard, right? Like, I'm worried that we're going to change this kind of smart planning of cities and that people mm -hmm. are going to rebel against that and everybody's going to want their own backyard. I don't have a backyard, but I can feel the, the, the pull of that. You know, I'm, I'm worried that we're going to get to this more isolated place, more car dependent, more mm -hmm. kind of distance from each other in a way that is contrary to sustainability. And so what will it take? What will it take for us to shift that narrative? Because that, that's the key. This is, this is a moment when things could go one of two ways. They probably go both, I think. But I mean, how do you how do you steer it, uh, you know, to go the way we want? I think there are different answers on, on the two sides, right? So the, the one is the kind of systemic structural stuff that Ali was talking about, and and then there's the more kind of personal reactions, and obviously they're they're closely linked. I think that the personal reactions probably will fade away. I think that we'll, you know, a, a, a year or so after a vaccine, you know, it's amazing how quickly we got used to being physically distanced when it felt so, do you remember how yes. awkward it yes. felt those first yeah. couple of days? And then within a week, even thinking about not being physically distanced felt so awkward. So I, I'm not actually so worried about that. I, I think that we'll get back to the place where we remember the joys of, of physical proximity with other human beings. It's the structural that, uh, that I think we're, you know, what it takes is really looking at those systems, really staring them down, really dissecting them, really thinking about, are these systems working for us in this century? All of our institutions, more or less, were designed for last century's problems, and they are not fit for purpose in this century. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the thing that strikes me too. Is is just you know how will we, how will we steer it? That's that's the thing that's been just obsessing me. To, you know, and I'm wondering what you think, Ali. How will we, as a society, get there? I mean, I think to me, it's about using this moment of of this calm. Like we have a break in business as usual, and. It's kind of what we've been dreaming of and we were doing it by blocking streets but guess what someone else blocked it for us right. so now it's about not falling too much into the i'm at home and i'm going to introspect and i'm going to become and and i mean it's it's lovely and it's great to take time for yourself and for a bit but at the same time i had this moment after a few days of, of social distancing and being mostly alone at home of saying well, you know, I can focus on being the perfect citizen at home or I can focus on trying to get those like online uh, fun courses you can get to get an extra little thing on your LinkedIn. But in the end, I was thinking, you know, who's not doing that? Eggs on mobile. You know, who's not doing that? All these big, big guys that are still in the political space, but digitally. And so I think it's about realizing that we, we could be wasting time by kind of doing nothing at home. And obviously, if you, you know, some people don't have the luxury to think about this right now. Some people have rent to think about. Some people have our frontline workers. But those of us that do have the time and the energy, really starting to strategize right now, as if, you know, we're strategizing. Um, and we're doing that at the university level by we're doing so much more intake than ever before. We're doing more training calls. We're actually kind of lobbying our own student unions into getting them 
to have a to declare real formal strikes as if it was like labor strikes but for climate which hasn't actually been done before um despite the fact that we call them climate strikes so mm -hmm. um i guess it's just kind of telling yourself okay like this moment is is not only it would be nice to act it's like crucial so kind of power mapping and kind of a campaign in a way at this point <laughs> yeah i think we need to pay attention to what the, the systems that we have in place are bringing about i think we need to recognize that those systems actually made us critically vulnerable to this right. current pandemic disaster in ways that also make us vulnerable to the ecological crisis, to the climate crisis, to this crisis of inequality and systemic oppression. You know, this short-termism, short-term thinking, this infatuation with economic growth, right? Both of those and this kind of uber connectedness as well, this, you know, need to, to be so connected with everything all the time and not to be able to take a step back not to be able to think about the need for resilience and buffers that's what produced this madness right it's what produced the pandemic in the first place the zoonotic disease getting out into humans and um, it's what produced it escaping from china because people the kind of nations were not willing to shut down their borders mm -hmm before we knew that the disease was in our country. Why would we wait? It just doesn't make sense to me. And then once we knew it was in, within Canada, yeah, and just the same as in every other nation, every nation waited until there was clear <laughs> evidence of community spread, basically within their own nation before they were willing to take physical distancing measures. Right. Why wait, right? So this like lack of preventative action is just a systematic problem. And, and it's partly also that obsessive, that obsession with economic growth, where the, the real economic impacts that we knew would happen if we shut down flights, right? The concern about the couple of weeks of doing that that might have been prevented it, prevented right. us from doing it and saving what is going to be now years of a much larger shutdown. Yeah. So it's just crazy short term thinking that we have institutionalized throughout society. Are, are we just not capable as a species of, of thinking to that degree, to that long-term plan, do you think? Is it, is, it, is it a fatal flaw in our species? I just have to ask. Do you think? I don't know. What do you think, Ali? I mean, I, I was going to say, you know, maybe, if anything, this crisis has proved how not ready we were for climate catastrophe and chaos. Yeah. And so it goes two ways. Either we think, all right, we just really are bad at this whole planning ahead and like, you know, <laughs> whatever. Or it's it's that lesson that we had been waiting for. But um, I think we are capable. I think we plan ahead in many ways. Uh, indigenous cultures do it very, very well by rooting it in, in the way they tell stories, by talking about the seven generations, by, you know, talking about um, what kind of ancestors they want to be. So I think we, we, we knew how to do it at some point, and some of us still do. So we can't. Yeah. No, I mean, that's a great point, right? Like many indigenous cultures have shown through their sustainable management of their resources that absolutely it's possible to plan ahead, right? But I think there is a crucial difference at this moment in time, and, and that is through our global connectivity and the massive growth that has happened in just a few generations, such that we, we can't say that we understood the phenomenon of pandemics, really, you know, until this moment, right? Mm -hmm. we, most nobody had really li had lived through, almost nobody, had lived through the Spanish flu from over 100 years ago, right? Just very few people, and they didn't have a memory of it. And so, you know, we were lulled into this position of thinking that, oh, it, it, it can't be worse than SARS or MERS, right? Mm -hmm. And, and, and with that notion, we didn't take actions that would have been appropriate given the uncertainty that absolutely it could be worse. You know? And so I think the real test, Alana, is for us to, to re having our lack of preventativeness and, and the, mass, the massive problem that that produced be revealed. Now that that's been revealed, can we then look to the climate crisis and say, look, we need to be prevented about that, to, to the ecological crisis, which is so closely ring, linked to that. We need to prevent these in a systematic and systemic way that, no. it, that we you know, have not yet been doing. The other part of this that has been so striking to me is, is to look at what happened to carbon emissions during these weeks of pandemic. So during April, I think it was, um, emissions went down something like on, day, on a day, comparing day to day from a year earlier, something like 17%. And that was when 
<clears throat> billions of us, I think 4 billion were shut at home and still emissions only went down 17%. So it, it just speaks to me of this whole anguished debate or discourse that we've been having in, our, in, in the public space about you know, how my personal actions affect you know, uh, affect the, the, the carbon crisis. And to me, it talks about systems that are, uh, of course, connectedness, the, the, what you've just been talking about, Kai, but also other systems of how we run our, our economy that are the things that need to change. It's not just all of us sat at home, you know, eating our kale, you know, you know, it's, it's much more profound than that. And I think this was a great example. It was just, it was stunning to me to see that the, that the drop was just that low. I saw so many disappointed people on Twitter, uh, you know, messaging yeah. me like, well, what do we do? Like, I mean, <laughs> we cut yeah. it completely. Yeah. Um, but I, and I don't know if this is just me. Sometimes I feel pessimistic saying that, but I feel like sometimes we struggle. And I've actually noticed it a little bit more in, in North America than even when I was in Europe. We kind of struggle admitting when something is very wrong and we struggle staying in some sort of sadness for a long time, or we struggle dealing with, wow, we're really in big trouble. We struggle with that because we right away, the first thing people tell me is, it's so negative, give me a solution right away. And I want to give solutions, but first you need to stay in the problem and get the problem and be okay with it. And just like Ravi was saying with, with white supremacy and racism, you have to stay in it to understand it until you can. Um, so I feel like we might, that might be playing into it. You know, we, we don't accept to be in that discomfort for a while. You mean discomfort with changing big systems? Is that what you're talking Wait. about? As opposed to, because it's easy to recycle, right? I mean, that 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 stuff, <laughs> that yeah. that's the really easy stuff. The hard the hard work is the stuff yeah. that Kai you've written about in that in the that's report right. is, is exactly yeah. the roadmap that you wrote is precisely what we're talking about here. It's the contradiction of the environmental movement as people have received it versus as you know yeah. systems theorists think about it right so right. so the way that people have received the climate pro crisis just because most of the people who talk about it then relate it in terms of what can you do as an individual right. so the perception is oh as an individual i need to recycle i should drive a little less i should fly less i should eat meat once a week or you know or whatever yeah. right it's like some collection of these things and there's two issues right with the statistic that you mentioned, which are really troubling. It was so worrying to me, Ali, just as you noticed, that many people thought, oh, so all that they said to do was only ever going to be this helpful. And it's yeah. like, well, hold on a second. That's, that's not quite true, right? So the first bit is that there are time lags to these things, yeah. right? So for example, if you live in Alberta, your energy is mostly coming from coal-fired power plants. Right. Those coal-fired power plants are not going to be shut down because there's a dip of 30% of, you know, of electricity, for example, right? They're going to keep going at full capacity because it takes a long time to scale them back. So there's all these time lags in the system that mean that it, you would have to cut your actions for, say, a year or more before you would realize the benefits of that. Um, but the second part is that it is not mostly about the little things that we can do as individuals. It is about the systems in place. So I don't know, have you guys taken um, a global foot, an ecological yeah. footprint calculator? Yeah. And have you ever looked to see what happens if you say that, you know, I, I, I'm a saint basically, like I, I do nothing wrong, <laughs> I do everything all the best. And if you live in Canada, it, the calculator will tell you that you're still using up more than, more than the resources that you should use up as an individual in order for us to collectively all be sustainable. It's more than one planet living, right? Mm -hmm. It's so disheartening to people, but it's because we need to work as individuals to change these systems. That's the reality, right? We need to, we need to take seriously the kind of the fact that our federal government and provincial government spending effectively subsidizes the fossil fuel industry in a way that is just built into our economy that is propelling both our economy, but also this massive climate crisis. We need to take that seriously. And despite the pains, we need to figure out ways to change that, right? And there will be pains and there will be people who put out, are put out by that in a major way. And we need to compensate them and be willing to do that if we're not the ones who are suffering. And it's not just Canada. I mean, this is, this is, a, this is the global situation is that those exact changes need to need to ripple through and it's so it's so interesting to me that some governments have have 
said, we're not sure whether it's going to happen, but they've said that they will take this moment in history to this unique moment, you know, when people are already shut down, when people are already thinking about the future and thinking about safety and thinking about working collectively, at least in some parts of the world, they're, they're saying governments that they will, that they will use this moment to move forward on a green agenda. And I'm just, I'm just, should I believe that? Good question. I mean, there's parts you can believe. For example, you know, all of a sudden our, our world was focused on lives. I mean, imagine if every day yeah. governments came out and said, so the GDP is, and instead of saying the number of, of cases or death, people would be like booing them and saying, we don't care about that. So, you know, I think there was a reaction. Um, we can believe that maybe new indicators will be put more forward, especially if we show that the public cares about it. Mm -hmm. um, I do believe governments might might see the advantage of being so transparent I, or as transparent as they've ever been for me, at least. So I've never seen my elected officials communicate so much with me as in the past few weeks. Yeah. And so I've been reciprocating in a better energy instead of just writing them when I was angry. I was also just saying thanks for the update, you know. And so hopefully these things, I feel like I was kind of hoping to you know, like reinforce their good behavior <laughs> in a way. <laughs> so hopefully that kind of had an effect. Well, I, I, you know, I think that we can believe them to a degree, but we also need to remember the scale of the spending that is going into that clean energy transition. Sure, absolutely. Some of the funding that, is, that has gone towards pandemic recovery has gone, just as requested by many environmental groups, towards this rejuvenation of the economy, towards a clean energy economy. And that's super. But we need to remember the scale of that spending in relation to the scale of the spending for fossil fuel companies and for airlines and, and the rest, right? The, and, and, and the conditions that are attached to those bailouts. Right. That that is absolutely crucial. Are they just bailouts or are they linked to commitments to change your carbon footprint? Right. Or, or whatever. Or to change your your policies in other ways that make you more environmentally friendly and more socially appropriate. Um, and so without those, there's a real danger that whatever spending we go, we put in towards the, uh, the clean economy transition will be absolutely dwarfed by all this spending that locks us in to the current economy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I guess I, I guess where I'm really going with this is I wonder what power do we have as citizens to force change or to press change? What do you think? I feel like the first one and that people might have realized with the past uh, protests and even riots is that the, the idea of democracy where we just voted every four or five years in some countries and then forgot about it was really not democracy. It was like a really, really run down version of it because I keep seeing these people, especially my age, that are like, wait, people have protested for a week and changed happened. And so um, <laughs> I think we realize we have power when we're really loud and insistent and not just politely asking for change every four years. Um, which can, can be upsetting because you think I actually have to put in a lot, lot of work, but I think we should be honest about that. Sometimes the environmental movement is not honest about that. We try to always make it seem like the transition is going to be all happy and, and really smooth and so easy. And we're just going to send a few letters to our MPs and tomorrow we're going to be fine. But I think it is going to, I honestly think it's going to take massive, massive um, protests and, and some unrest and, and we're kind of ready for that. The youth knows that it's kind of, it might happen and it's okay if it does, it's what's needed. Even beyond, so even thinking about the electoral cycle, there, there's still more, much more that we can do, you know, that because historically many of us have just accepted the kind of suite of offerings that we have. And, and frankly, in many cases, none of those are really sufficient for attacking the climate crisis and the ecological crisis and the rest of it, right? They're, they're not going far enough. And so we, we just need to expect more. And when it's not offered, we need to be willing to step up, you know, and, and, to, and to really show what it is that it would take. And so hopefully Ali, when she's done, will uh, we'll run for office and we can- I was gonna ask if you were running, if this is her <laughs> way of announcing your candidacy right now. <laughs> oh, no, we're not doing that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I really think that's absolutely crucial. And, for, and what it's gonna take is also, I think, for these crucial structural issues that really mean the difference between a happy, 
sustainable planet and one that is really unsettled, unsafe, unsecure, and, and deeply unjust, that we put those key priorities as ones that trump all the rest, right? It, it's not, it can't be like economy or the environment. No, 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 no. It's got to be, we have to get certain things right. And the rest of this stuff that makes a marginal difference to people's lives, absolutely. We'll do the best that we can within those parameters. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I wonder whether, you know, why we haven't expected more. I mean, we know, we, we are not it's not a surprise to us that the stakes are really high, not just us here, here viewing and, you know, but people in the world generally know that really we've got a big mess. This is not a big surprise. And so why haven't we expected more? Why haven't we insisted? It's a philosophical- The world is, it's, it's a complicated new world that we have not, we were not evolved to deal with, you know? where historically we evolved in contexts of groups of, you know, up to a hundred mostly, where most of our actions that affected the environment would be experienced by that group of a hundred. People could witness it, they would experience it, they would resent those who, who did wrong, right? And it was so very tangible and immediate and direct. And now we're in this context where Every day we buy products that are coming from countless nations, right? In terms of the raw materials and the, and the component products that get assembled and, and then, you know, just shipped over to one place and then, you know, held by a retailer. Like all of these different nations are affected every day by our consumer actions. And we just don't have the means of ensuring that that consumer action has a net positive impact on the planet. Mm -hmm. And that's crucial, right? Historically, we could do that. We could make sure that we were having a net positive impact on our local environment in terms of both what it meant for nature, possibly, and also for the people there. And we can't do that yet, right? And so think few, about- There are a few countries that are. There, I mean, you've got to say, look at New Zealand, look at Iceland. I'm going to say, you know, Scotland, Finland, I think are are part of what's known as a well-being economy. And they, they that's their- metric are are people doing well is the environment doing well are, are citizens actually thriving but it, it seems like it's such a fledgling movement <laughs> yeah i know no, but it's more than that so i'm talking about individual purchases right so mm -hmm. it is just it is so normal within our current economic system to externalize environmental and social costs and, for, and and it's just worked into the system such that everything that we buy comes with negative environmental and social consequences mm -hmm. you know the shrimp that you buy may may come on the backs of slave labor in you know in various less developed countries it also comes with a, you know every pound of shrimp comes served with a, a four to 10 pounds of bycatch of sea turtles and albatrosses and, you know, yeah. and other ocean creatures, right? And, and so we can't help but have those negative effects on the planet, but, but we could conceivably, right? So what I like to imagine is a world where every time you made a purchase like that, it, it, at the moment, it would have these negative effects. But imagine that every time that you made a purchase like that, you also, a small amount of money from that purchase went towards citizens groups and, and community organizations and NGOs and, and even some of the, you know, the fishermen in order to mitigate those negative effects, right? So imagine that when you buy on a shrimp, you've also got a payment. Yes, it, it does mean a risk to sea turtles and albatrosses, but you've got a separate payment that goes towards installing turtle excluder devices in shrimp fishing nets or even in tuna nets, for example. So that on the whole, when you add it up, and this is not perfect, right? It's an offset. On the whole, right. you could still have a net positive impact on wildlife and the ocean, right? It, it would be a, a solution for the transition. Right. So that you start to you use that pressure to bring about better practices in the first place so that the turtles are not getting caught in the first place. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it, it would be one way that we could have new social norms. Right. That, that we could that, say, yeah, but what you're talking about there is 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 breaking some of the again, the stories that we're telling us about how we are here on the world. And that's what I'm wondering about when I look at this moment that we're in this historical moment with the, with the pandemic, with the, with the, the protests, with, with things that 
as I said before, that the, the story seems to be fraying. And I'm wondering, is this the moment when we can rewrite those, those elements of this story that we live by? Ali, what do you, do you think? I mean, do we I think, have? I don't, so I, I try, I feel like I'm always a pessimist, but I try to never romanticize them <laughs> any moment because then I feel like we deceive people and I don't want to do that. I don't want to say we're going to bring all of this and by the end of this pandemic, we are going to be better people <laughs> because we might not be. We've seen racism research during the pandemic. We've seen a lot of things. Um, I do think we can and we should be ourselves. And especially if you're, you know, as content creators, as, as creators, as people that have um, some sort of voice, or recenter, you know, saying what Kai is saying, we used to be in communities where we could see everybody. And now our individualism is pushed much more through the media we consume, through everything we have, we're being told. At the same time, I feel like we're also being squeezed of a lot of things, you know, and we're being told you have to fight for yourself in this world, like you have to, it's kind of a competition, you have to get others out. They tell us that in university, because we're always ranked compared to each other, they tell us that. Um, so I think, you know, for example, if there's, you know, like professors thinking of this, they can change. So in all of our roles, changing the culture, the values behind it, that might help. And that's what the pandemic might allow, because we maybe have the time to think about it, have the chance to think about it. Um, I'm still on the fence about how much will fully be changed by the end of this. Um, mm. But I do think it's a momentum to see. So I do think it's not going to happen automatically. But but people that have any position of power. And I do think, you know, teacher is a position of power in many ways, any leadership position is, um, they have a, a power to use this pandemic to do it. Yeah. I think any moment can be the moment, you know, yeah. for, for any individual person. It's not gonna be the moment for everybody at the same time. But, you know, for me, it was a few years ago where I, the, the climate crisis was just so pressing that I just, it, for me, it was just a, a pivotal moment when I just said, look, I. I'm gonna do two things. I'm gonna, I'm gonna mitigate the greenhouse gas emissions as best I can. It's not perfect through carbon offsets, but through the best ones that I can get, not the cheap ones on market for every flight and for my heating my home and for driving my car. And, I, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna tell everybody that that's what I think that we should all be doing if we can. For me, that's a new social norm. The second thing that I'm gonna do is I'm also gonna work towards reducing those, right? Because reducing my flights and reducing the rest in intangible ways and so I've been campaigning to stop traveling so much for work and for other purposes and and will continue to try to push for that and it then works. actually there's three things the last one is that because it's not just climate and because we are also affecting the ecological world through other means through land degradation and through direct harvest and all the rest of it I'm also going to work to make it possible for people to have net positive impacts on all of nature not just through climate mm -hmm. I think what Kai is showing is just exactly what I think we're all dreaming about is that every person in their role and in who they are find the pathway to changing things. And so, you know, people will ask me, what should I do? And I'm like, I don't know. I've never had your job in my life. I really don't know what an electrical engineer should be doing right now. But you know, you know yourself best. You know who in your family can change. Seeing my own parents change, uh, my dad who you know, worked more in the, in the finance sector and now changes and will call up people saying that's not even real uh, investment in SDGs, you know, things like that. My mom who worked in communications and now wants to work in communications for the climate. You have the power to change, but only what you know and what you are in, you know? So what Kai was just kind of exemplifying is whatever your specialty is, whatever your role in society is, that's the one thing you can really, really change. But how do you change the systems within which we work? Because it, it is more than just changing one's own personal footprint. It's, you know, as this 17%, you know, however we look at it, as that showed, it's, it's, it's more than that. And that's where, that's where I'm taking hope from seeing people taking to the streets on, on, you know, on white supremacy saying, look, we're just not going to stand for this anymore. We, we're done. <laughs> It seems to me that that's what I'm seeing, and I'm seeing a lot of, I'm seeing a lot of recreation. I'm seeing, I'm seeing art is actually what I'm seeing. I'm seeing people even now in these early days making meaning from all of this um, with art, and I, I, I just feel like there's, there's the potential here, 
now because we're so mobilized, because there's so much energy out there saying, look, we are not going to stand for this anymore. And, you, you know, in my life, I have not seen this pre precise thing. I mean, I guess maybe it happened 50, 60 years ago, but I haven't seen this. And so I'm, I don't think it just ends with the pandemic. I don't think that that energy just, just goes away and, be, and becomes, uh, you know, neutralized. I think that there is a residue here. And I think that the residue will show up, I hope, in the stories that we're able to write about what our society means and, and what we're here for. That is, th that's what I'm thinking. That, that I, I know it's not a guarantee, but I just, I just feel like this might be, uh, that this can't have all happened for nothing in a sense. Yeah, I mean, I agree that the arts tap into this part of us, this like emotional self that is so key for those transformative moments in the way that like statistics never work, right? Not for most yeah. people anyway. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, what is it going to take to change those systems? I mean, so it's those political pressures that we were talking about before, as well as the pressure on companies right because it we really can expect more from companies we can boycott and and those boycotts can actually mean something so you know across the system it, it is a kind of call it's for activism you know to really put pressure where pressure needs to be put and to demand more not to say accept no for an answer mm -hmm. yeah. we're gonna start accepting questions in a few minutes just just to let you know so i, I just want to prepare our audience for the, for that thrilling moment when you can uh, enter questions on our on our hashtag, which is hashtag um, field notes TC. I have to check that. But, but but I guess I guess what I want to before we go right there, I just want to say, do you think it's do you think it's going to take all of us? I mean, is there what is the critical mass <laughs> that's that's needed to to really? I mean, you both have thought about this a lot. I I just you know, it feels like we're all together now. And I, I'm just wondering if it's enough. I think there's that number going around of like 3% of the population is enough to create a revolution or something. I have no clue where they found that number. But <laughs> we like to say it a lot in our calls because we counted how many university students we had just in Quebec and Ontario. And we have more than 3%. So that's that was. But I think, no, I think it seriously will take all of us. And it will take a lot from from many of us, at least. Um, and, it, and that's sometimes a little sad to hear. But at the same time, it's, I, like to, I like to think about it because it's telling you you can all be activists, once again, in the roles you play. And it's no longer a big word to be an activist. I think an activist just means standing for something you believe in. And you can be, I love to see doctors uh, coming to climate strikes because they have that position in society that people trust them. I love to see people, um, artists especially, saying, you know, my art is activism, but not in a way that should be controversial. Activist just means we're going to push all of us and each other um, towards the right way. And I think it might also take all of us holding each other accountable, which yeah. is a bit of a hard part, but it's, um, I don't know, maybe Al and I told you this before, but I have this one friend and sometimes when either of us feel like we're getting less radical, we say like when the, the things, everyday life just, um, gets us tired, we call each other and, you know, I, I'll say, okay, Peyton, I need you to radicalize me again. I'll she'll just start <laughs> saying stuff and gets me angry and I'm back. And so I think we need to do that for each other, <laughs> maybe in a less formal way, but we need to do that. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's going to take all of us. Uh, honestly, I think there are going to be laggards and I think that's going to be fine. I think that, you know, there's enough power in a convinced, convicted minority. And then, you know, ho hopefully it'll be a majority, but I, I think it, it'll probably just take a majority and, and that there will be some folks who, who just are never really brought on board, who are grumbling, but who learn to live with it, learn to accept it. Um, and, but I think, you know, to get it rolling. So the 3% figure that Ali threw around for, it comes from the literature on what has brought about social transformations in the past, mostly around kind of human rights. Um, and so social issues through disruptive activities, through nonviolent disruptive activities. Um, that's the 3% figure and, and that's the, the logic of Extinction Rebellion, et cetera. But for, for those of us who aren't willing to, you know, sit on a bridge for 14 hours and get arrested, for example, then, uh, then you're, you know, you're not counted in that 3%, you're, you're in the rest of it, but you can still play a really crucial role in, 
in facilitating that. Um, and so I completely agree with Ali's point that, that all of us can play a crucial role, even though it won't need to be all of us in order for this battle to be won. And they'll all be different roles, probably. We all won't be doing the same thing. We have a question from Twitter. This is from Sean Mc, McManus. Um, and it's Mabel, age nine, uh, is asking us, what should kids do to help climate change? Should we do more climate strikes? I think that's an alley question. <laughs> I'm super biased, but no, no, stay home and just... <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yes, I think we all agree. That's a yes. <laughs> yes. Definitely. And even more than that, I would say explain very well to especially your parents or anybody that, you know, deeply cares for you in your life. Why? Because when you start explaining why it, it, I think it hit my parents very hard when I told them I strike because I'm so scared that my degree is going to be worthless because we're just going to have to deal with, you know, this chaos. Um, I'm scared to think about having a family. And as a, as a young woman, that's a really weird question not because of, you know, population control reasons at all, but just because I don't know if I want to impose that on a, on a new person coming on earth. I don't want to impose the same worries I have. So yes, I think you have to strike and say why, like shamelessly. Ah, okay. What about you, Kai? What do you- oh, I totally, yeah. I totally agree. Yeah, no, I, I don't have anything useful to add. Just uh, <laughs> resounding yes, absolutely. Okay, here's another question. Um, uh, from Alexis Liana, how do we help the people who will lose their livelihoods as we transform the system? Is that a myth or will jobs be replaced by new work created by the change? That's a Kai question. Yeah, sure, I'll take that. We have to attend to this front and center. It, it is really crucial. When we think about an economic transition, it, it is gonna mean new ways of working. It, it, and, and that is going to be harder on individuals than it is on companies. For companies, individuals are substitutable, right? And, and they use that logic, unfortunately. Individuals are tied to the skills that they have and to the, you know, the places that they live. And they have so many other constraints that are imposed upon them. Um, and so it, it is incumbent upon us as a society to be really attentive to those who, whose jobs are getting squeezed out as, as we think about the kind of economy that we need for the next 50 years, the next 100 years. Um, and, and that means being really serious about retooling, retraining programs, and then also about compensation packages for those for, for whom that will not work. It is true, absolutely, that a clean energy economy will likely yield more jobs in total. Um, and eventually, it may, they may also be equally paying jobs. At the moment, fossil fuel jobs in the fossil fuel industry are generally better jobs in the sense of, you know, higher benefits right, and higher salaries. Um, although there are many more jobs in the clean economy, um, clean energy economy. So, you know, there, there are some real differences and, and we have to be willing to, to make that possible for people who are going to suffer because some people will. And the reality is that we need the skills of the people who are in those jobs now. It's not, we, we you know, our, our, our society will need those skills, read, you know, diverted into some other types of jobs, I, I guess. It's, it, this is about justice, isn't it? It's about climate justice, ultimately. It's not just about forcing everybody into some little, um, you know, doing the exact same thing at the same moment. Yeah, I, we have time for one more question. Uh, this is our final question before we end. This is from Mike Colling. Does the panel have any concrete ideas about how we can leverage our new degree of community mindedness as a result of COVID-19 in order to address climate change? Are there any practical steps we can use to leverage this new political reality? Great question. It is a good question. One thing that some communities have done is to make a pledge for carbon neutrality within a decade or, you know, it, it'll depend on what the community is as to what time horizon makes sense. But, but there are communities around Canada that have pledged to be carbon neutral by 2050 or earlier, and they're tracking and they're making amazing progress to do that. So absolutely we can do that. You know, when, when we break it down, the steps towards that are, are varied. They're different. Right? I mean, it, it has everything to do with changing the electricity supply, you know, providing incentives for people to have solar panels and wind farms in, in that vicinity. Um, but uh, lots of different steps. And, and there are tools that are available that, uh, that I'd be happy to help point 
people towards if they're interested. Okay. What about you, Ali? What do you say? I mean, I fully agree. I think it, it'd be amazing. I know there's a lot of groups, communities that have gotten together and closer during COVID to help each other. And it'd be great that you, you formalize this new relationship you have to each other by becoming a just recovery group, a, a group that cares about not only during COVID, but after COVID. And you decide that as a collective. And I mean, I, I love community led initiatives and I love the very grassroots and I'm not saying that because it, it sounds good, but I, I've noticed that that's where there's the most creativity actually that comes from and big groups in the environmental movement are awesome for resources for um, like having tools for us and things like that, but where ideas come from where really um, a lot of energy a lot of, of diversity of minds is is usually those community groups that uh, kind of come to us or join us or um, so I, I hope that people can kind of make that transition to we cared for each other now during this time right. how do we um, maybe like formalize it like pledge to as kind of saying pledge to caring after mm, okay I, I have one last question for for us to, to, to consider here and I, I and then we'll we'll have to say good night but I the question is is just how do, you, how do you think this is going to end? I want to duck that. I don't, I don't want to predict uh, the future. Yeah, what, what I want people to do, because I think that, like, really, it's up to us, right? And, and so that's where I want to end it. I, I want to end it with people thinking about how, you know, just as you did with that amazing McLean's article that you wrote about 13 months ago, um, that, that thought about, what the world could look like in 2050 if we actually address these problems. And, and I think that that's, that's what we need to do in this moment. We, we need to envision what that world looks like, right? Not, not to imagine all the negative scenarios. Like, yes, those might come about, but we have the power to bring about that better world. A world in which we are actually, you know, we have a well-knitted social fabric that you were talking about as becoming frayed, that we are not contributing further to climate change and actually, you know, starting to already reverse, to decrease the atmospheric concentration of pollutants, that we're solving these problems, that we have clean water and abundant life in forests and water, rivers and lakes, that we have, you know, coral reefs still on our planet, right? Like, let's imagine that planet. And, and living happily within that. And let's be convinced by that conviction to yeah. work towards that every day. Yeah. I agree. I don't think I could top what Kai just said, but I do agree that just like we could not have predicted what 2020 had in mind for us and so much happened, uh, we shouldn't try to predict it because we might be more pessimistic than we, than we might actually end up. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe it's more thinking where could we possibly end up? Like, what's the, what's the best case scenario and how do we get there? But really dare dream about it. Not just say, oh, it'd be nice to be in a just recovery and not know what it means. Like, I wanna imagine myself in a city where there's never a car and there's all these things and there's, there's green everywhere. And, you know, I wanna imagine it and be able to say it and say it and no one laughs about it or thinks, are you crazy? So um, it's more like, where do we, what Kai said, where do we want to be? And what's the best that could happen, really? Right. For me, it's, um, you know, for me, I, I have to go back to the arts because that's what feeds me. And I'm thinking of a, of a note I got the other day from a poet um, who was writing about this time. His name is Paul Kingsnorth, he's British. And he sent this note and he said, he, he, had the, he has this sense that we have all gone into a, a folk tale in which we have drunk a magic potion and this magic potion has brought out in us the things that we most need and least want and I thought you know it's going to take art to explain to us that those are both the same things and and to to try to figure out how it is that we maneuver how we write a new ending to all of this because I do think that that's what's needed a new a new story to our society of, of what we're here for and, and what we really truly want in our lives. I'm sensing so a new play here. I'm sensing a new play coming <laughs> on. I'm excited. <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. And so with that, I think we will, we will end. And I, in this moment, I just want to say, in this moment, it really feels like 
anything is possible if we really, if we dream about it, if we envision it, if we, if we write it, if we, if we make it, make meaning out of it somehow with art forms, with, with our words and our emotions and our, and our, our, our hearts, our love. And so I wonder from our audience, can you tell us, let us know what you think about that? What, anything is possible in this moment. What do you think we should do with it? I hope you tell us on social media. Good night. Thanks for being here. Thanks, you guys. Thank, Thank you, Ola. Thank you, Ali. Thanks, Kai. Take care. Good night. Good night. Bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.